I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This week, Nick DiVirgilio sits down for a wide-ranging interview with Glenn Sobel, drummer with Alice Cooper. They discuss his history, his equipment, what it's like filling in for Tommy Lee with Motley Crue, and lots more. Check this out. How you doing, everybody? Nick DiVirgilio here, and my very special guest today in studio is Mr. Glenn Sobel. Welcome, man. What's up, nice Nick? to have you here at Sweetwater. Thanks, man. It's been great. Is your first time here? Yeah, unbelievable place you got here. I, I haven't even had a chance to really see everything, but yeah, I get the idea. You guys are big. It's a pretty fun place to be. Yeah. It's kind of like the Disneyland of gear. Lots of toys to play with all the time. Yeah, it's been like a long time and I finally made it to Sweetwater, so I'm happy to That's be good. here. For sure. Did a master class yesterday. Did that. And you're in town with Alice Cooper on tour. Show is tonight, yeah. Matter awesome. of hours. Now, uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of things today, but how, how long have you been with Alice Cooper now? This is, uh, I'm going in, into my sixth year. It's like crazy how the time flies, but yeah. That's killer, and uh, it's got to be a fun show to play. So how did you land that gig? Well, the gig happened out of a recording session. Back in 2010, I did a session in Nashville that Tommy Hendrickson got me on. He is one of our guitar players. I've known him for a long time, over 20 years. We were in a band together. He became a producer. He was getting me on sessions when he could. You know, that's how you get on recording sessions. Yeah. It's the producers that hook you up. People often wonder about that. But there was a session in Nashville, to make a long story short, it was an Alice Cooper session, and we were remaking note for note some of the hits like School's Out, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Elected, and Bob Ezrin, the original producer, was overseeing the whole thing. Nice. And people always ask, well, why? Why are you doing that? And Alice is re-singing why. Well, because if a video game or a movie or a commercial wants any of those songs, now they can just go directly to the artist and management that owns these newly recorded masters. And people generally are just gonna be thinking they're hearing the original or a remastered version of the original. I had to transcribe every note. Right. And uh, it went well enough to where a year later they were kind of revamping the show and I was suggested for the tour, but I hadn't met Alice. Often as a Even studio, at session. no, oh, yeah. uh, often as you know, at a session, yeah. you don't meet the artist you're playing That's for. True. It's like you and the producer, maybe some other session players. And uh, I was suggested and Alice said, okay, well I sang over his tracks, but I gotta see him. My drummer's gotta be flashy. He said something like that. True. So the magic of YouTube, they pulled up some couple of videos. And then of course, my buddy Tommy vouching for me, like, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm not gonna go AWOL, disappear, whatever. <laughs> And, and having other friends in common with the guys in the band, that sure. all made Alice go, okay, yeah, he's in, that's the guy. Simple as that. And I met Alice on the first day of rehearsal. Nice. Weird, right? But these well, things happen. Totally, and that's, I've, I've gotten a lot of my gigs in my life the same way. It's who you know, your friends recommend Always. you. And yeah. uh, that's just how it starts. In so fact, I've rarely, I don't know if I've ever gotten a, a, a gig where there's been one of those big cattle call auditions where there's like 25 drummers lined up. Because yeah. I've been on the other end of that, where you're auditioning bassists and guitarists all day or two days straight. And I'm thinking, I can't remember bassist number 10 or number 15, and <laughs> it's draining. Yeah. yeah, the the bro hookup, I call it. Very nice. Yeah, that's how things work. In that gig, you get to play with, well, huge PA, big show, big production. You were telling me there's pyro, and obviously mm -hmm. there's props and stuff going on. Um, Still very typical of Alice Cooper's shows from yeah. way back when, right? So what's it like dealing with that kind of stuff around you when you're trying to, you know, play your parts and put on a show? How do you have to deal with that kind of stuff? Well, what's important to know with an Alice Cooper show is that it's truly a production. And as a drummer, yes, you're putting on a performance, you're putting on a show. There is a flashy element to it. But you have to be a musician in the way that right. you have to watch for cues, there's props that we have that he's been known for, right. the guillotine and things like that. And I have to watch a lot of times for the final hits of certain songs. And I watch them and the band watches me, so we're tight. We work all this out in rehearsal. Of course. Sometimes we even change things after playing a few shows. We have to tweak some things. Uh, while I'm doing a drum solo, Alice is doing a costume change. Right. While we're playing a certain song, Alice's wife, Cheryl, who is in the show, uh, she's doing a costume change and on this one particular song she was having to rush so much so the third verse that we had originally cut out of that song we had to add back in and we didn't figure that out until you know we were five shows into the right. tour so we're oftentimes we're still rehearsing at sound checks yeah that's typical yeah. it's show, like a Broadway shows, show yeah, with breathe blood. and <laughs> with blood yeah. that's awesome cool 
Um, now, do you guys play with tracks or any kind of backing material that you have to kind of sync up with? Or are you just kind of just live? Are you on in-ears? I'm happy to say that we play with no backing tracks. Good. That's a rare thing. Now, there are occasionally some samples that are at the beginning of a song, some sound effects yeah. to bring in the next song, you know, a siren or other things like that. Or the beginning of Poison, there's this ominous low uh, hum, like a chord being held out before the song gets counted in. But no backing tracks. Everybody that's singing is singing for real, right. and we're lucky. Most of the guys, they sing lead in their own bands. Right. So yeah, we get asked occasionally if there's anything that's uh, canned vocals. I play some of the songs to a click track uh, using an Alesis SR16 drum machine that my drum tech, he uh, operates that. But some songs don't work with a click. Most of them, I'm not doing that. Right. A song like Under My Wheels, it doesn't work with a click. It needs to ebb and flow a little bit. Sure. And I can't do Poison with a click. The chorus needs to push up like a couple BPM maybe, and then the second verse, it's back down. But other songs do work with a click, like Billion Dollar Babies. I like playing that one with the same consistent 183 BPM, I think it is. And mm -hmm. So you just you figure that out as you go, what works best. And uh, sometimes the guys have an opinion in rehearsal, and I like to ask them after the first show, okay, what do you think, tempo-wise? And it's funny when they say, well, that one song sounded fast. I said, yeah, we've been doing that one with a click for five years. You know, and, and it's just, you, you never know. Everyone has a different perception of tempo, and then there's adrenaline with the live audience. Sure. And, uh, but you have to be able to trust your own internal clock after all. You can't use that click track as a crutch too much. Totally. But yeah, that's a long answer to your question. No tracks, but sometimes click, yes. No, that was good information. Thanks. In keeping with Alice Cooper gig, since you, you know, it's a hard gig, you work hard at it, you're playing a lot. How do you stay in shape for this gig? Do you, ha do you have to stay in shape for this gig? You really do, yeah. It's truly athletic. And there's a friend of mine, when I first got the gig, that friend said, oh, Alice Cooper, that's a demanding gig. And I, I wasn't quite sure what he meant yet, but I found out really quick. With an Alice show, he does not break character. He doesn't talk between songs, ever. That's just not what he does. So it's one song into the next, into the next. And that can get kind of draining sure. sometimes. So uh, fortunately this year, the set is a little different. I actually suggested like, hey, I really need a break. I, I spoke up. I mean, there was a couple times last year I almost passed out, you know, the hot outdoor festivals, the dry heat, Sure. you know, uh, or it's happened where we play these theater gigs where the power is being drained so much that something's got to give and then the air conditioning goes out. And wow. it becomes the hottest, sweatiest show ever. <laughs> and then there I feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a heart attack. But yeah, uh, Nita Strauss, one of our three guitar players, she does a guitar solo for about two minutes on her own. Right. And she's amazing at it, and I'm glad we have that. And I go, yeah, take your time, all right, great. There's a ballad that we added back into the set where I, don't, I, I convince them I don't need to keep time on the hi-hat right. so I can genuinely take a break and take a drink and towel off and uh, a common thing that drummers do, and I haven't done this yet, is have oxygen tanks there. Singers do it, right. drummers do it. Uh, I know Tommy Lee had that back there during their tour, and it just sometimes seems like a fresh breath of pure O2 would help. And, and some people wonder why, but as you know, drumming, it's, it's athletic, man. Totally, man. Yeah, when you're giving it up on a big show like that, you're working hard. Yeah, we're not tapping through this. We're playing hard, and you're getting beat up back there. And some people understand that and some don't. I just think that's funny. But having those little two minute breaks here and there, it makes all the difference in the world. But definitely when I'm home, I'm working out. I'm making sure the, the shoulders and the neck are staying strong because that, right. that takes the most uh, abuse, I guess, during a show, for sure. With you just saying that, that leads me to your history. You've been playing drums for a long time. We've known each other for a long time. We've back. actually known each other for, since probably the early 1990s. Do you even want to say what year? Is that embarrassing? Well, it's, it's been a good while. It's been a good while, yeah. for sure. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised, and so is Glenn. So that's where yep. we met in the clubs of L.A., kicking around, being just working musicians around town and right. meeting a lot of the same people. So when did you actually get your start playing drums? How well, old were you? professionally, are no, we talking? No, just how, when did you start, start? I was 11, but I didn't get a drum set until I was 13. Okay. But there was middle school, junior high. And this is one of those things. It's like music programs disappearing. It's so sad because so many musicians, myself included, got their start in school, right. public school. Right. But I was in beginning band class, somehow I got put in that, and I wanted to play drums so bad, 
problem was so did about 15 other guys. Right. They couldn't have 15 drummers, so we had to pick numbers out of a hat. I got lucky. There was two numbers left and I picked the right one. I'll never forget that. Wow. Yeah, otherwise it would have been put on trumpet or something like that, you know, boring. Do you think that would have changed your, I don't know, your the history? The that could have been a little crossroads of, right there. You might not have yeah. done, okay. That could have been. So that's an interesting moment in your life. Yeah, yeah, I think back, uh, I could remember it like a, you know, plain as day, but from there it was a second year band and then high school marching band, jazz band, concert, orchestra, uh, the plays. I tried to do everything. And then I got in a rock band, we'd play parties. Right. So in high school, I was playing a lot of stuff. I was lucky that, again, we had a school with a lot of music programs. And then I had my friends, my best friends still to this day, we put together a rock band and we'd play parties and we'd play covers and some originals and awesome. invite everybody when someone's parents went out of town, you know, one of those deals. And sure, that band had a very big impact on me as a drummer because I, I went through this serious jazz guy phase, which I'm glad I did, but right. in high school, 11th, 12th grade, I was all about, you know, Weather Report and Ma Vishnu Orchestra, Billy Cobham, Return to Forever. I was starting to go to the Baked Potato, world famous little hole in the wall jazz fusion club in LA. People show up, they go, wow, this is it. It's just like a big living room. Yeah. But I was going there on the, the weekends watching like guys like Everybody. Vinnie Coliuta yeah. 10 feet away. Greg Bissonette, a mentor of mine, would play there a lot. But yeah, they kind of got me out of that a little bit and they reminded me, oh yeah, rock and roll. This is, this is where you have fun and you're not trying to show off. And right. so to this day, I credit that first band of mine, Bourbon Street, as being the band that helped steer me in a different direction. So I played a lot in school, for sure. That's great. All right, with all that being said, let's get to your first kind of pro gig. How did that happen? Well, what I was, was uh, what do you call your first? Yeah, it, it would be Tony McAlpine, the guitar player. Sure. For sure. He's an amazing, accomplished musician, not just on guitar, but piano. On every record he'd put out, there would be a piano piece by Chopin or something like that. And an amazing, well, I guess he was put into the, the genre of neoclassical guitar players. But I think his first record was very important because it kind of bridged the gap between Metal and Fusion. It was a record that came out around 84, instrumental, and it had Steve Smith and Billy Sheehan okay. called Edge of Insanity. And I had that record, I loved that record. And uh, Greg Bissonette, who I had been taking lessons with, he called me up one day and said, have you heard of Tony McAlpine? I said, yeah, I got that record, man. I love that record. He said, well, start learning the tunes because I just gave your number to his manager. And go. I got the gig, we did a record, it was my first record. It's still one of my favorite records I've done. Right. We did a very short amount of rehearsal, maybe four days for these instrumental songs, but it was a good little boost of confidence. Like, oh yeah, I can do this. I can get in the studio and play and do the whole click track in the studio and change things. And you need those little things to, sure. to boost your, uh, to boost your, your confidence. So we didn't tour really too much. We did local shows, NAM shows, things like that, but that was that was the first gig. Cool, and then you've, got, you've done a bunch of stuff since then. So sure. tell us about a, you know, some of your side work leading up to Alice Cooper. Well, uh, the, the Tony gig led to other similar gigs. That's, what, that's what's gonna happen. You play in one genre, you're gonna get known for that. It's not the worst thing to get put in like a box, because at least it could lead to other work. There was Chris and Pelletieri, Jennifer Batten, that was a very fun instrumental record. She played with Michael Jackson for years. Sure. Uh, Gary Hoey, that was my first real You've done tour. a lot of records with him. I mean, a lot of things with him, right? I'm with Gary Hoey? Yeah, yeah. We did a, a studio record, a live record, some movie soundtrack work. Nice. Yeah. That was my first real U.S. tour. I had done a little bit of touring in Japan with Impelitary, but that was always a quick week or two in and out. And in Japan, they just treat you so well. It's not really like a tour like you're in a van and you're in the U.S. and you know, I really count the first true tour and getting out there into the trenches as being the Gary Hoey tour. We were all over the, the country and he had, had an, as an instrumental artist, he had a couple of hits. So we were able to play some clubs, some festivals, but it was like, okay, I'm, I'm playing too many of these guitar gigs. I gotta show that there's a different side to me. And fortunately, I got in this band with Tommy Hendrickson, who is in the Alice Cooper band. That was like a pop punk thing and people were surprised and I was liking that. Right. That they saw me playing on a four piece kit, playing these real straight up punk pop tunes and 
There was a Cypress Hillside project that was uh, with Send Dog from Cypress Hill when rap metal was doing really big. That was he was all about that, and uh, that worked out well. Although Cypress Hill was very busy at the time with their own big hit, Rock Superstar. So right. the side project always falls by the wayside when the band, the main band, has a ginormous hit. Right. I got a call to join Beautiful Creatures on Warner Brothers. That was my first major label deal. Went through that whole machine, learned a lot. Sure. Did Ozfest. We met with several producers. We had the same A and R guy that had signed Lincoln Park, and so we were watching them blow up as we were working on our record. That was very educational. And so every manager and every producer was coming to us to our rehearsal room to watch us. And at first it was like, why is everybody? Doing this, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, we have this A and R guy that has all this attention on him. So we would have these meetings, and that was like such an education. Just sitting down with a manager, a big name manager, for two, three hours, right. and hearing them talk about their past clients and the records and the mistakes they've made and the successes they've had. And uh, we had a good run. Ultimately, uh, they changed CEOs at that label. Kind of a lot of typical. This stuff, happens yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's kind like of trickles you know, down. And, you get yeah. your quarterback on the football team, but then they change quarterbacks and throw out the playbook, and you're finished. You know, you got no representation anymore. But I still get people coming up to me to this day with that CD to to sign. We're all very proud of that. And uh, from there, there was different yeah. projects, a lot of other things the next few years, and then finally Alice had come up and. You also did a, a cool thing, which I, I guess just happened by chance for you, when you filled in for um, Tommy Lee with uh, Last year. Motley Crue, right? Because you were touring together, Alice and Motley Crue. Did he get sick? Did he something happen? He didn't get sick. He had a severe case of tendonitis in his wrist or his for, forearm in this area. And, yeah, it happened one day. I was in my hotel room, and we had been on tour with them on and off for a while. So, of course, that helped to just even hear the show in the background. Sure. But I get a call from their production manager, Robert, and he's like, I need to talk to you about something serious. Can you fill in for Tommy tonight on the show? And the first thing I said was, okay, who's messing with me? Right. Of course, I thought it was a joke. There's, there's a few practical jokers in that camp, but he assured me it was serious. And so I went right into that mode. I said, okay, have a, a guy pick me up, get me to the venue, have Adam, that's their sound guy, have him make me a recording of the latest show on a thumb drive. I'm gonna sit with a laptop in one of the production offices and make cheat sheets. This is what drummers do, you've done it, I've done it. Mm -hmm. It's not transcribing note for note. Uh, if the kick snare pattern is one thing for the verse, you write that out and you write the number eight over it, meaning eight bars of that kick snare pattern. Uh, it helps that of course Tommy Lee is a big influence, but even if you think you know a song really well, I still make the cheat sheet. Sure. Because you never know. Yeah. I mean, what if, Vince, uh, what if Vince Neil doesn't sing? Right, I mean, that, that happens. He just lets the audience sing. You can't rely on anything. I have to have the music stand there. I said, get me a music stand with a light attached to it. They have a lot of pyro on their show. A lot of bombs going off literally on the sides of the drum set and... Uh, did you have to use his drums or did you use your kit? No, I used my kit and we scaled it down. Between sets, my kit is usually uh, 10, 12, 13, 16, 18, 14 over here. For that, we took away all the stuff on the left and just went 13, 16, 18, kept okay. the two kicks up there. Okay. But yeah, Tommy's tech, Nick, and my tech, Michael, they did a great job because there was like a 20, 25 minute changeover. They were able to switch it up quick and that worked out really well. I, I had his uh, subs and his monitor rig behind me. I was on ears and so is Tommy, but this was like massive amounts of subs. You hit that bass drum, just, just <laughs> Yeah, the biggest sound I will ever have. I mean, with Alice, we do great. I got the, the graded riser with the sub underneath, plus the, the Porter and Davies. Right. The seat thumper, you hit the bass drum, it vibrates the, the seat, and it's, very, it's a very inspirational thing when you can feel the bass drum when you're playing it. And yeah, but it made the Alice sound feel small after that, but I was pulling double duty for a week on that tour. But that had to be a lot of fun. It was, it was stressful the first day, but I knew, okay, I'll just get through the first show and we'll be good. The first show, I wasn't worried about putting on a performance. It was about focusing on the music stand. I didn't want a train wreck Motley Crue in front of 10,000 people. Right. They have click tracks on everything, which is a big help when you're subbing. Their lighting show is synced up. Like if Tommy does a da 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 psh, a fill, the lights are going 
it, in sync. The lights are programmed to do that. And they have a guy there that runs all of that. That's cool. So yeah, it helps that everything's on a click track. And after the first show, yeah, it got, it got fun. I did five shows and- uh, And they were cool? They were good guys to work for? They were totally cool. Tommy was cool. I felt, of course, bad for him. I've been in the, the same position where I had an injury and I had to, yeah, I had to step break. aside yeah. and have a sub. It's happened to a lot of drummers. And that's one of those things. People don't realize how much you're getting beat up back there. But uh, I finished out that leg of the tour and then Motley Crue had a couple weeks off and I guess Tommy had gotten a couple of cortisone injections and we came back and toured with them in Europe and he was fine. Awesome. Yeah. That's some good stories there. But he was very, very cool. He was able to talk to me in the in-ears while I was playing and uh, all the guys were, were really cool. Great. We miss them. All right, so now let's get into some of the technical stuff, your gear. Your drums, you're a DW player, right? How yeah. long have you been with DW? It's pretty, pretty short it's stint pretty new so for far, me. Right? Yeah, yeah, I announced it in January. Okay. Yeah. And how are you liking it playing I'm DW drums? I'm so happy with it. I'm, I'm loving the drums, the snares. It's, it's this good problem with all these great snares. It's like, well, what snare do we use? I don't know. They all have great characteristics. And we've settled pretty much on the knurled steel, 6.5 by 14. I've used the knurled bronze a little bit on the Alice Tour. And uh, at home, same thing. I've been using those as well as the, the brass, six and a half. Great drums. The drums, the, the kit itself, it's, uh, it's maple, pure maple, nice right. loud drums. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't do anything fancy or exotic. I just went for the, the good old fashioned maple. Great. And you've been a Sabian player for quite a long time, right? right? Yeah. I got to, I got the great opportunity to go check out the Sabian factory not too long ago. I've been I was there. there a couple of weeks ago, really. In McDuckdick. McDuckdick, yeah, Canada. It's a village. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing to have this symbol factory like on a lake in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. But it's such a cool place. And their product is really pretty impressive. Watching those guys make symbols I love hand. watching them yeah. make the symbols, yeah. yeah. So what's your normal, what do you, what's your symbol setup? Do you have a bunch of different lines or do you kind of stick with one line? The what? Alice gig, um, well, there's the Legacy Ride, which I think is really important to the gig. It's got that wash okay. to represent that 70s era. It's got enough of a bell. Uh, for crashes, I've got 1920 AAX explosion crashes. Uh, I have used some Paragons 1920 as well. The hats, the main hats are, uh, they're great. They're 15 inch HHX power hats. Okay. And so, so big symbols a lot of times. Sure, yeah. For the Alice gig, it's big symbols, yeah. yeah. And we do get that compliment that the drum mix is really great out front. If I'm doing a couple of little double stroke things, there's not a lot of that on the gig, but people right. hear that. Okay. Yeah, that could get washed out if the mix isn't good, but those hi-hats, they're so crisp, yet they're 15s. So the minute I played those, I said, oh yeah, these are, these are great for the gig. Uh, got Holy Chinas on each side, eight, uh, 1920 Holy, Holy Chinas, it looks cool. Uh, the hats on the, the right are 14 inch Metal X hats. Got a 12 inch AAX splash, I think that covers it okay. for the cymbals. Nice, and then Evan's drum heads, yeah? Yeah, yeah, uh, clear G2s on tops, that's pretty standard, it works. Right. Clear G1s on the bottom. The snare head has been uh, STs lately. Sometimes a, we put a heavyweight on, but not on the tour. When I'm home, it's a heavyweight sometimes. That's a newer head that Evans makes that's really nice. And uh, the Hazy 300 on the bottom. The bass drum has been EMADs mostly, sometimes GMAD or EQ4, is it, or EQ3? Yeah. I always yeah. forget. But I like to change things up. Sometimes you need something fresh because you get burned out on something, and sure. then you get a new sound, it's like, oh, okay, I'm inspired now again yeah. to, to play something. But that's been the setup. That's great. So before we finish off this video, why don't we talk about your website, what you're doing on the social media side of things. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, that's, that's been key. I mean, there have been drummers that come to me for drum lessons, private lessons. I do that a little bit when I'm in town. They're often wanting me to consult them about the social media thing. I say, look, you gotta have a presence out there. I've got a... Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it's easy. You just type in Glenn Sobel and you'll find me. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just been essential. A YouTube channel, if you get recommended for a gig, people are going to look you up immediately. Yeah. It's such an easy way to steer them to, to what you do. It's like an audition almost. Totally, yeah. yeah. Way different than the early days when we were just coming up, wasn't it? I mean, Very. this internet age is making that kind of thing at least a little bit easier for people to find you. Yeah, well, I'm surprised at the amount of people that don't have good quality stuff of themselves on YouTube. And when I say good quality, it doesn't have to be pro shot, but something that people get an idea of you playing and how you look when you play. Yeah. And if you have shows, you can film a ton of shows and you can cherry pick the good stuff that 
sounds good, looks good. Um, I just think we got all these tools to do this today and it's getting better and better with all the Zoom type of uh, gear that's coming out. I have a Zoom camera that I like and the GoPros, they're all, they're all really amazing. All right, that's some great info there. And finally, this Alice tour you're on now goes until when? It's pretty, it goes throughout the rest of the year pretty much, yeah? Yeah, right now we're booked through uh, up to Halloween, but I think they're working on some November stuff. Great. Possibly, yeah. Well, we got some breaks. We got we got July off. At least we. Alice also has the Hollywood Vampires. It's a record that came out last year. I played on five or six tracks. It's also got Dave Grohl on a track. Uh, Zach Starkey is on some because the Hollywood Vampires was the drinking group in the early '70s. It was Alice, Keith Moon, John Lennon, uh, wow. Harry Nilsson, Mickey Dolenz. There's a plaque at the Rainbow in Hollywood on Sunset commemorating the Hollywood Vampires. So there's this record that was made. Johnny Depp is a part of it. That's a separate group that Alice will be touring with. Uh, Matt Sorum's on drums with that. And uh, they'll be doing a little bit in July, so I'll be home right. in July. I've got Thomas Lang's Big Drum Bonanza coming up, okay. which they hold at DW. And uh, that'll be a lot of fun, early July. And a couple other things possibly coming up. I have a regular Wednesday thing when I'm home at Lucky Strike in Hollywood. It's this fun uh, resident band gig where we back up all these people that come in. Uh, we've backed up Sebastian Bach and Nuno Betancourt. A couple weeks ago they had Jackson Brown. I was out of town for that one, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's a fun gig where every week there's a whole new batch of songs to learn. Cool. So if you're in LA on a Wednesday night. <laughs> yeah, go see him, that's right. And if you're a, you see Alice Cooper coming to any your town close by, make sure you get tickets, go check it out. It's a killer show. Glenn kills the gig, a lot of fun to check out. And I encourage you to go check out Glenn's website, all his social media stuff. A lot of great information and great playing and entertainment. Well, you know what I'm coming saying? Coming from you, man, that means a lot. Killer player here. Thank you very much for coming and talking to me here at Sweetwater today, man. It's great to see, see you again. Man. It's been a long time. So uh, congratulations yeah. on all the success you've had. And, uh, Thanks. you know, hopefully many more years to come. Thanks. Much appreciated. Great to be here. Thanks to Nick DiVirgilio and Glenn Sowell for a great interview. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.